Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'd like to call this meeting for Tuesday, October 13th, 2020 to order. I apologize for the uh, delay in starting. We were having a couple of technical difficulties on a couple of accounts, but we all seem to have that all worked out. Um, as we begin, I'd like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, so members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, when I call your name, if you could just <coughs> let me know you're here. Uh, Roger DuPont. You're on, you're on mute, Roger. You're on mute, Roger. Here. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you. Uh, Patrick Hanlon? Here. Kevin Mills? Here. Aaron Ford? Here. Stephen Revelack? Present and able to hear you. Excellent. Um, Sean O'Rourke will be a couple minutes late, uh, but he'll be coming. Um, I'm actually here, Christian. <laughs> oh, you are here. Wonderful. Just <laughs> sneaking in. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, to town officials, um, Rick Valarelli? Loud and clear, thank you. Perfect. And uh, Jennifer Raitt, the Director of Planning and Community Development is here. As is um, Emily Sullivan, who is the, um, the Conservation Commissioner. Um, and uh, Council uh, representing, um, the, so uh, Paul Haverty, Paul here. Paul is here. Um, and uh, Stephanie Kiefer, are you here? I am. You're here, perfect, thank you. And uh, Marty Nova from Beta Group, are you here? I am here. Perfect. Okay, this open oh. meeting of the Arlington Zone Board. Let you know I can see you. Oh, I can't see you yet. Yeah, I, no, okay. I, if you okay. are, um, yeah, let's, you are. If you are not on, please mute yourself. Thank you. Um, this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020. The order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period indicated on the posted agenda. And there was a, a detailed breakout of the agenda that was added um, to the online agenda. If you, uh, if you look at notice, uh, one of the last attachments is the detailed agenda for discussing Thorndike Place. Um, and so that will be a detailed agenda for this evening. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom webinar app with an online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it is being uh, broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Other participants are participating by phone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you your screen name or another identifier and take care not to sh share your personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background and remaining muted when you are not participating. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. As chair, reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. Okay. So for the start of this meeting, um, the first item on our agenda is the approval of the minutes from the October 6th, 2020 um, meeting. Um, members of the board, are there any uh, further corrections to the minutes Seeing none, can I have a motion to accept the minutes? So move to second. Thank you. So Chairman, Mr. Revelak, I think had something that he wanted to say. Mr. Revelak, yes, sir. Yes, I did have a correction. Uh, I would like to propose a correction to agenda item five, update on residential design lines development. Okay. 
Uh, so there is a sentence in there that reads, Mr. Rebelak asked if the group had addressed the ARB report with respect to floor ratio and lot area per dwelling unit. Okay. Um, I would uh, ask that the board consider changing this to Mr. Rebelak asked about trends in FAR and area per dwelling unit shown in the residential design guidelines working group report to the ARB and how the working group sought to balance the needs of different stakeholders. Okay, was that, is that consistent with the email you had sent earlier? That is, that is read directly from it. Okay, perfect. Okay, so the motion would be to accept the minutes, including the, um, the proposed amendment by Mr. Revlack. Um, so moved. Thank you. Second. All right. Um, asking for votes for the board, uh, Mr. Mills. Approve the minutes. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Dupont. Yes. Mr. Revelak. Aye. Oh, excuse me. Mr. Ford. Yes. And uh, chair says aye. That is a affirmative vote. Chairman, I I didn't vote yet. Oh, I beg your pardon, Mr. Hanlon. <laughs> But I vote I just the like everyone else. <laughs> Mr. O'Rourke, I know, was not present at the meeting. So, um, then the next item on our agenda is approval of decisions from the October sixth hearing. Um, we have decisions on two of the items. Uh, Mr. Hanlon, do you want to just say a brief word about that? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, uh, we've got drafts that have reflect the corrections that have been made by various uh, members of the board, and I believe that it has accommodated everything, it, at least I've intended to do that. Um, one of them is the 72-74 uh, Grafton Place case, and the other is the uh, 21 uh, Oak Ledge case. And I... <clears throat> Uh, so I, I'd like to move each one of them sequentially so we get a separate vote on each one. Uh, so I move that the board accept and approve the uh, proposed final decision in uh, 7274 Grafton Street. Second. Second from Mr. Mills. Okay, for a vote. Um, Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Revelak? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Okay, and then Mr. Mr. Chairman, I move that the board accept and approve the uh, proposed final decision in uh, 21 Oak Ledge Street. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. Vote from the board, Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Revlak? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. And the chair says aye. So that is approved as well. Thank you very much for preparing those, Mr. Hanlon. You're welcome. Okay, so that brings us up to item four and five, which is both the same for Thorndike Place. Um, <clears throat> before opening the comprehensive permit hearing for Thorndike Place, I want to take a minute to review some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. I will ask the participants to introduce themselves and make their presentation to the board. I will then request that the members of the board in consultation with our outside counsel and consultants ask what questions they have on the information that has been presented. After the board's questions have been answered, I will open the meeting to public comment. Public questions and comments will only be taken as it relates to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Due to previously demonstrated interest in this project and to provide an orderly flow to the meeting, the chair strongly encourages individual public speakers to limit their comments to three minutes each and to use their time to provide comments related to the topics discussed at this hearing. Please note that there are multiple hearings scheduled for this project and each hearing will have an opportunity for public comment. The chair also encourages the public to provide written comment to be reviewed by the board and included in the record. The chair will first ask members of the public who have previously identified themselves by logging in through Zoom who wish to speak digitally to digitally raise their hand using the controls in the Zoom application. You'll be called upon by the meeting host. Your audio and video will be unmuted and you'll be asked to give your name and address and you'll be given time for your questions and comments. 
All questions should be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. The chair will then request that those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. When called upon, your line will be unmuted. Please identify yourself by name and address. You'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. Once all public questions and comments have been addressed or the allocated time has been expended, the public comment period for this evening's hearing will be closed. As noted previously, there are multiple hearings scheduled for this project and each hearing will have an opportunity for public comment. The board and staff during your comment, please ask us to do so. Board will then discuss topics for the upcoming hearing and a proposed con a continuance to a date certain. So the first <clears throat> sub item under the uh, comprehensive permit discussion for this evening is a discussion as to the status of the 100 day hearing schedule. Um, by state law, the, from the start of the hearing to the close of the hearing has to be 180 days unless additional time is granted by um, assent of both parties. So uh, today is day 49 by that schedule. Um, day 180 will be February 21st, 2021. Um, and I had wanted to ask the applicant, um, I know that one of the, that the intention is after this hearing that we will be, um, the applicant will be spending several weeks preparing additional documentation um, and then there'll be time given to the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the, the board's consulting engineers to review. And I wanted to ask if the uh, applicant would be willing to consider that time uh, to stay the clock during that review period. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so you're suggesting the time period from, I think we suggested November 3rd through November 24th? From the, the period from today until November 24th. Oh, okay, okay, I understand. Um, I, so we're talking. I believe it's 42 days. Weeks, I think, right, approximately? I think it's 42 days, yeah. Okay, um, I, just to clarify the, we've already agreed to extensions before, so the 180 days we mm -hmm. agreed to kind of restart the clock and then um, what I noticed in your notes, I'm not trying to dodge your question, but just to uh, give a little clarification, the board is to make its decision within 40 days of close of the public hearing. So I wasn't certain if um, the, the board fully appreciated that. So um, there is that time period. Um, in terms of um, whether or not we can agree to a, a, a 45 day tolling, if you will, right now, um, I, I would like to just confer with my clients on that. Um, I probably, I don't think it's probably going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, if we don't do it at this point, as we get into it more, if we agree to that, because I think that part of this, and we recognize that what we're going to be presenting this evening is a revised concept plan. So we recognize that, you know, there may be a need to um, further extend time periods. So I don't know if we want to talk about that right now, or um, if I can take that under consideration with my clients and then get back to you um, to confirm whether, you know, we agree to uh, 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 kind of a, a suspension right now for the next 45 days or whether we just agree to a, an extension, of, you know, the already extended 180 days. But I, I think that we can work it out is what I'm saying. And I'm not trying to be cute in any way. No, no. And I mean, my, my concern is also that obviously we're getting into a a period of time where there's a lot of holidays and we're probably going to not be able to schedule a couple of meetings um, because of conflicts and so I just wanted to make sure that we don't end up heading into February without a plan for uh, for completing things. Okay okay um, if we could just uh, put a pin in that for the moment I know you want to get on with the hearing and um, we can either confirm by the end of the hearing or I can confirm by an email tomorrow if, if that okay. 45 days is okay, if that's okay with the chairman. That's fine. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> the next item is a discussion as to the completeness of the application before the board. So we, at the past meeting we had uh, voted to request that the applicant um, revise the, the state of the completeness of the project and either 
provide requested documentation or provide a schedule for the delivery of that. Um, to, a, to a great extent, that has become um, that is going to be drawn out now because we are of the the nature of the revision to the plans that we will be discussing this evening. Um, and so, with that in mind, I would uh, like to propose to the board that we uh, effectively suspend the review of the completeness of the application until after the November 24th hearing, at which point we will have um, much more detailed documentation, which I believe has been a major portion of the requested documentation. Mr. Revelak. Uh, yes, I just want to do a uh, follow up on with respect to documentation. One item I wanted to follow up on uh, in response to the working meeting with the Conservation Commission. I was curious if BSC had provided their field sheets to beta for the purposes of verifying the wetland salination. Thank you. Uh, my understanding is that my understanding is that has not been delivered to date, um, but that is something that we will we can certainly bring up in the in the board discussion. Um, so specifically, uh, sorry, was there another? Mr. Chairman, I, I, yes, if you're ready for a motion, I can I can make one. Certainly, if you wouldn't mind, um, Mr. Chairman, I move that the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, hereby suspends the review of the completeness of the comprehensive permit application for Thorndike Place until the applicant has completed the detailed design documentation to be provided on November 3rd, 2020. That has been received and the hearing has removed on November the 24th. Thank you very much, Mr. Hanlon. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Mr. Chairman, if I could address that just for a second, I, you know, we keep on pushing this off and I understand why this is really part of not just 40B, but part of the planning process. But as we look at the overall schedule, even with the tolling that we've talked about earlier, um, time is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. The Conservation Commission still has lots of questions. Uh, we still have not addressed transportation and there are lots of other issues that uh, need to be addressed and we're at the point where um, we need to we, we need to get a lot of answers sooner uh, and so I think that we've generally been pretty uh, I wouldn't say relaxed exactly but we've been understanding about the nature of this process but uh, I think the applicant needs to understand that we're pretty getting pretty close to the point where the information has to be uh, has to be provided and to their credit they've suggested that they will do that uh, but I'm hoping that that uh, by the time November 24th comes around uh, we will have made major progress and have many fewer comments saying we need more information before we can evaluate this. Thank you Mr. Hanlon. Uh, so a vote of the board. Um, Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Revelak? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. O'Rourke? Mr. O'Rourke, do you have a vote? Sorry, I said aye. Maybe you didn't no. hear. <laughs> right. Thank you. And the chair says aye as well. Uh, so that will bring us up to item number three review of the uh, the peer review funding under chapter 44 section 53 G so these are funds that are provided by the applicant for the peer review of the applicant's documentation by um, a consultant hired by the board um, the board's consultant in this regard is beta group um, and they have been uh, reviewing the documentation uh, provided so far uh, the current funding um, the board has requested and received at their December hearing um, a sum of $10,000 to be uh, going forward for the hiring um, and as part of the work by the consultant. And at this stage, um, we need to go back and to, um, to allocate some additional funds for that purpose. Um, and so, Ms. Keeper, we would <clears throat> like to request um, an additional sum of $30,000 to continue the work of the, the peer review consultant at this time? 
Uh, Mr. Klein, could we also um, receive a, uh, um, um, the invoices or the, uh, the summary of, of what, what has been completed and, and what those costs are, as well as um, the projected scope, just so we have an understanding of uh, what that request is responsive, what, what, what it went to and what it's, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah, no, exactly. It, certainly. Um, so, so far, the, the billing has been running through the, uh, through the legal department, um, and Doug Heim's not here this evening, so, uh, but I will make that request of him in the morning okay. um, to have that and have worded to you, but um, uh, if I could have a vote from the board in regards to the request. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Hanley. Um, I move that the Zoning Board of Appeals request the applicant to transfer an additional amount of $30,000 to the appropriate town account to continue retaining peer review consultants. Second. Thank you. And to that, I would just add that the, uh, the board will provide um, I guess the requested background information on the on the current billing to the applicant. Okay, Mr. Hanlon, that was seconded by Mr. Mills. So then the vote of the members of the board, Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Dupont. Aye. Mr. Revelak. Aye. Mr. Ford. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. And Mr. O'Rourke. Aye. And Mr. Klein's votes. Aye. Thank you all. So that brings us to item number four, presentation of a revised project by the applicant. Um, so Ms. Kiefer, um, will, will Mr. Hessian be, um, who will be presenting on behalf of the applicant? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if you will, I will just do a, a brief introduction, but um, BSC John Hessian will be doing the, uh, the lion's share of our presentation this evening. Perfect. And um, at, the, at the end of his presentation, there will just be a quick follow-up um, just to um, update the board on traffic. So um, Scott Thornton from Vanessa. Oh, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you got it. Um, good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Um, uh, we're pleased to um, appear before you this evening and pleased to present um, our revised um, concept design for the, for the project, which, um, at, as you know, at the last hearing in August, on August 25th, we, um, we had an ability to take in the comments from the peer review from Beta Group, um, uh, Emily Sullivan from the Conservation Commission, as well as the board and, and members of the public that commented um, on, on the project design that um, as, as it had been like slightly updated in, in March of 2020, but it was essentially the, the same design that we came in with. Um, and so after that August hearing, um, we went back and evaluated the comments. And, um, and from there, we, uh, we reached out and we had a, uh, a coordination call with um, um, the planner, um, yourself, town council, just to um, and we said that we were looking to revise our concept um, and we were working on a coordination of, of how to present that to the board, get it to peer review, and also loop in Conservation Commission. Um, and during that call, it was agreed that we would submit our revised concept um, to the board and, and peer review by the end of September, so September 28th. We submitted that and then on October 1, um, we conducted a, a work session before the Conservation Commission presented the revised concept plan to them. Um, and so um, with that information, we're, we're now back before you this evening to present it. Um, and DSC will be doing the lion's share um, of our revised concept plan. Um, but um, just briefly, as I think that this board was, was um, given a, a quick overview at the last public meeting by you, Mr. Klein, um, the project has been revised to um, really minimize um, impacts to wetland resource areas and getting it out of the buffer um, and the local bylaws, they call it the aura. And then there was concerns that there was an isolated wetland over to the east. And so what we've done is we've revised the project, shifted it um, a bit northly, removed the townhomes, and, and also substantially reduced the footprint of the multifamily building. 
Uh, I'm not going to get into all of that because John does it much more aptly than I do. Um, and I will leave that part of the presentation to him. Um, uh, but just quickly, our goal for this evening is um, that this hearing be an iterative process. And um, similar to the feedback that we received when we were before the commission at their work session on the 1st of October, um, get feedback. So as we move to um, refine our plans and, and give them greater detail and, 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 and more informative, we've also gotten feedback from the board, from peer review, from the public, um, and, and we'll work with that and incorporate um, how we can to fit that into our design. Um, and as I stated um, before I pass this over to John, um, at the end of John's presentation, um, Scott Thornton from Vanessa um, will be giving the board an update on the traffic. And unless the board has any questions at this time, I'm, I'm going to pass it on to, uh, to John from BSC. Oh, please proceed. It's all yours, John. Thank you. Good evening. Um, am I all set up to share my screen? The host. John, you're good to go. All right, let me try that again. Okay. I ask if somebody could confirm that you're seeing a slide that says March 2020. Um, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Stephanie, um, Mr. Chairman, and members of the board. Thank you again for the record. My name is John Hessian. I'm with BSC. Um, my goal tonight is to walk you through uh, what we consider to be significant revisions to the to the site plan for Thorndike Place that the applicant has undertaken. Um, you know, really in response to, um, as, as Stephanie mentioned, at the last hearing in August, we had received, you know, beta groups, peer review comments on this plan that's on the screen before you. Uh, we had received a July comment letter from the Conservation Commission. And a lot of the feedback we received from this board and, and members of the public at that August 25th hearing really focused on, you know, the wetland resources. And I know that the Zoning Board of Appeals has broader, um, you know, scope review, but we really focused our efforts and, and the applicant focused their efforts in on um, what we felt were kind of the, 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 the biggest issues were the, the wetland resource area, um, potential impacts and, and, you know, looking to try to minimize those, um, those impacts. So after that August 25th, as, as Stephanie mentioned, we started to go back to the drawing board, had that coordination call, like I believe it was September 11th. Um, and really from there, from the 11th to the 28th, worked with the applicant on a revised plan to do just that. And I'm, I'm teasing you, you're looking at the original plan, but I'll show you the, the revised plan in, in just a moment. Um, but a little bit of background, I think, it, it was really those, the beta comments, the CONCON comments and, and others feedback that we had received at that August 25th that, that drove the, um, the redesign, if you will. So with that as a backdrop, uh, the plan that you see before you is the slightly revised plan that was submitted in March of this year. Um, it, it really is very similar to the plan that was originally submitted in 2016. Um, we had gone out, BSC had gone out in January, which I will acknowledge was not the appropriate time of the year to do an updated wetland delineation, but we were under a some schedule constraints uh, with this board to get that work done. Um, we are, I will 
update everyone. We are scheduled to go back out in the field this Thursday to confirm or adjust that delineation from January. Um, there was a question asked earlier about the field data sheets. Um, I will have to admit that I am not a wetland scientist, but our wetland folks who did the delineation in January um, educated me in the last couple of weeks that those data sheets essentially are not worth submitting from January are not worth submitting to beta because they would be deemed incomplete because there's certain information that could not be collected in the winter conditions. But on this Thursday, we will be back out there reviewing the wetland line, um, completing those field data sheets, and hopefully by you know the end of day Friday, beta will have those and they will be at, at their prerogative um, to, to go out and review the line in the field. We are happy to have our wetland scientists join them or if they prefer, um, they can go on their own and follow up with any questions or comments. So, um, you know, that's the update on the wetland delineation. We're fully acknowledge um, the commission and beta's request to get that work done in the growing season and that's underway. Um, but what I mentioned at the hearing back in August, and you can somewhat see at the scale of this plan, there's, there's two different dashed blue lines, if you can see my cursor pointing to this wetland area. Um, because it was a winter delineation, we looked at our delineation and the delineation from 2009 that was part of the original application. And for planning purposes, um, we took the, the, the most conservative wetland line to establish the, the local bylaw 25 foot no disturb and 100 foot buffer, which is um, the adjacent upland resource area. Um, that will go back to a single line after this Thursday once the, and after beta review, once that delineation has been reviewed and, and confirmed. So what's shown on this exhibit is you know the blue dash lines are the wetlands. Um, this white dash line is the 25 foot no disturb. The white dotted lines represent the 100 foot buffer, 100 foot um, adjacent upland resource area. These are the two isolated ve vegetated wetlands in their respective buffers. Um, and this orange line represents the 100 year FEMA floodplain, which is elevation 6.8. Um, so for the, for the working session we had with conservation on October 1st, and actually the ZBA received this same information, a transmittal letter and these two exhibits, um, we had looked at the potential impacts within these resource areas under this plan. And, and we had summarized that in a, in a table form. Um, and we broke it out by both regulated resource areas uh, under the Wetlands Protection Act, the State Wetlands Protection Act, and as regulated under the local Arlington um, Wetland Bylaw. And again, it's been, it was pointed out in the, in the Conservation Commission's um, updated letter that they submitted after our working session. Um, we acknowledge that flood, uh, floodplain impacts are in a volume impact, but just for comparison between the plans, we look just at the, the area, the footprint of floodplain that work was proposed within. Um, and we also looked at what the impact was. Was it building? So the columns are building. Was it pavement, parking lots, parking spaces, sidewalks, or was it other? The other impacts would have been just grading, landscaping, um, things of that nature. And also we had the, um, the, the trail or path that meandered through the, the wetlands on the remainder of the property in those numbers. Um, so those numbers are there for comparison purposes, but you see definitely impacts to the, um, in the floodplain to the isolated wetlands. Um, no impacts on the original plan to 
uh, ordering vegetated wetlands under the Wetlands Protection Act and under the local bylaw. Some work within the 25 foot no disturb. Um, I mean, to the isolated wetlands, no work within the 25 foot no disturb to the bordering vegetated wetlands. Um, and then work within the buffer to both the isolated and bordering vegetated wetlands. Um, so as I, as I mentioned, you know, from basically that September 11th conference call to the 28th when we submitted these revised plans, the applicant, um, yeah, really went back to the drawing board and looked at pulling the development footprint, you know, out of the wetland resource areas. Um, you see, there's some still some floodplain impact, but essentially the building is entirely outside of any um, any wetland resources regulated under the uh, the Wetlands Protection Act or um, the local bylaw, bordering vegetated wetland, the ARA, the 25 foot <laughs> and the isolated vegetated wetland. I acknowledge we still do, you know, the floodplain is a resource area and we still do have some um, impacts in the uh, floodplain. What I will point out though, is that these uh, two fingers of the floodplain are at the extreme upper limits of the floodplain and the, the existing flood storage in those fingers, if you will, is very shallow and the um, we do not see it as a as a challenge to mitigate or, or provide compensatory storage for those um, you know minor impacts to that floodplain. The for comparison, I guess I should while we're on this plan. Um, so the original plan included six six duplex townhomes, so 12 townhome units uh, located along Dorothy Road and so, uh, six times to 18, so 201 units, dwelling units in this multi-family building uh, that's labeled East Wing and, and West Wing, at more to the, to the southern portion of the site. Um, the new plan has eliminated the townhomes. As Stephanie mentioned, we really, Pulled the development, um, you know, further to the north, closer to, to Dorothy Street, um, and in doing that, eliminated the townhomes and reduced the overall footprint of the multifamily building. And as you could expect, we're still refining it at the um, Conservation Commission working session a couple weeks ago. Um, I presented that we were in the we were looking at about a 20 or 30 unit um, reduction from that 219 on the original plan, 219 dwelling units, a reduction of 20 or 30. And as the plan continues to refine the architectural layout, the interior of the building, um, it, it really looks like we're closer to, um, you know, maybe 175 to 180 total units in this building. Um, and you'll also notice that there's you know very limited surface parking shown on the plan um, and there's a there's a little dialogue box on my screen that's blocking <laughs> my view um, but up in the northwest corner we had shown you know potential additional parking we we believe that we are not going to need that with the reduction in the number of units that we'll be able to meet the zoning requirement um, for parking for you know that 175 to 180 units with parking under the building and that small uh, kind of visitor parking on the uh, west side and one of the conservation commission members actually kind of recommended that we look at the area that we were reserving for that potential additional parking as uh, a location for compensatory flood storage or, or potential option for compensatory flood storage. Um, so I'll, I'll just jump ahead to, you know, for the, the table of comparing the impacts and, and really what 
um, should jump out is all the all of the zeros that are shown in this table. I acknowledged earlier that we do still have some floodplain impact, but we're confident that we can provide that compensatory storage. Um, I, I will mention that in our working session with the Conservation Commission, we discussed a little bit whether we would meet the commission's two to one compensatory storage requirement um, or the State Wetland Protection Act one to one. And part of the decision making on that is gonna uh, revolve around a um, functions and values assessment of the adjacent upland resource area where we would do that compensatory storage in order for the con commission and uh, the applicant to make an educated decision on w which which provides the best you know the, the highest and best value the compensatory storage or the the values of the R um, as it exists today um, but again we eliminated the isolated wetland impacts the uh, impacts within the 25 foot no disturb to the isolated wetlands, the impacts to the 100 foot buffer to the isolated wetlands, and the you know the the very minimal 1,203 square foot um, impact to the 100 foot buffer to the bordering vegetated wetlands is not building. It's it's actually um, the emergency vehicle access for the fire department that is within that buffer. And working with the fire department, our goal would be for that to be a uh, pervious material, a grass creed or something acceptable uh, to the town and to the fire department for that use. Um, so with that, I just wanted to, um, again, you know, our goal, and I wanted to actually thank um, the Conservation Commission. Our goal for that working session was to get, you know, feedback on this revised plan. Um, I, I think we felt that we succeeded in that goal. We got some great feedback, some great comments um, that are further helping to um, kind of drive the design of this project in the, in the right direction. And we're looking forward to hopefully a similar dialogue here tonight um, through uh, any questions and comments from the board. And with that, um, as Stephanie had mentioned, uh, Scott Thornton has some brief comments, very brief comments to update everyone um, on the status of the traffic study. John, quickly, before we get to that, um, could you just walk the board through with the proposed building being closer to the street, the, the multifamily, um, how, how we've scaled back and stepped back the roof height. Oh, sure, sure. Sorry, I forgot to do that, Stephanie. No, thank, thank you. you. Um, so in order to achieve the density, the 175 to 180 units, but to also um, try to mimic what was be trying to be accomplished with the townhomes of a smaller scale adjacent to Dorothy Street, the these three tabs of the building, um, that are you know, closest to the street would be three-story uh, three multifamily. The main spine of the building and the three tabs to the, to the south, it steps up to a four-story. So, and, and these areas between the tabs on, um, on along Dorothy Street would be you know, courtyard areas. So there'd be further setback of the building, that four-story building would be set back um, and there'd be some opportunity there for some, you know, landscape and hardscape features to soften that um, architectural elevation. And, um, but yeah, three stories along the street and stepping up to four stories at the main east-west spine of the building. And I, I, I think with that, if uh, Scott, if you want to briefly provide an update to the board um, on the traffic. Sure, sure. 
Thank you, Stephanie. Um, Mr. Chair, members of the board, my name is Scott Thornton. I'm with VAI. And um, uh, just to give you an update on where we are with the traffic study, uh, we met with uh, the town's consultant beta group and with town staff to discuss a methodology for moving forward with the development of the traffic volumes and proceeding with the preparation of the traffic study. Uh, we have a mix of historic data, um, older traffic counts at some of uh, the intersections in the study area. Um, we also supplemented this with data collected last month at some of the locations requested by beta because there was, there was no or extremely limited traffic count data at some of the intersections along Lake Street that beta had requested we study. And these include locations like Wilson Ave and Homestead Road and Margaret Street, Birch Street and Brooks Avenue, uh, which were locations that were requested to be studied by beta. So we got traffic counts at those locations and, and you know, to, to adjust those volumes up to um, appropriate conditions. Uh, we developed COVID adjustment factors, seasonal adjustment factors, uh, uh, also factors for, uh, for passage of time and, and annual growth uh, based on existing continuous count station data maintained by MassDOT. And in general, where initially uh, we, we have been doing, you know, tra everyone, everyone's aware the traffic volumes have, have decreased substantially. Uh, particularly in the few months after the um, sort of the announcement of the COVID pandemic. But traffic volume, everyone has probably also realized the traffic volumes have started to spring back up. And um, we had been doing traffic counts and, and monitoring traffic volume uh, changes in the region. And we had noticed that in say April or May, traffic volumes were down by 70 to 80% from typical conditions. But lately in the last month or two, traffic volumes have picked up, uh, uh, to not, still not back up to pre-COVID conditions, but we observed uh, uh, traffic volumes in general being in this area, being off about 26% uh, for the month of September. So, you know, we had, we had developed these adjustment factors. We, we balanced the traffic volumes out for the study area network and provided our baseline traffic volumes to Beta and the town last Friday for review. Um, once they've had a chance to look them over and get back to us with any questions or comments, and we've agreed upon the, the, the methodology and the, and the use of those traffic volumes, will prepare the remainder of the traffic study. Um, and you know, there's, there's other adjustments that, that are to be made to the project uh, uh, trip generation. There's, we have information on the bike path and the volumes on the bikeway. We have information on the proposed uh, signal improvements at Brooks Ave and at the bikeway. So I think we're in pretty good shape to, once we get concurrence on those baseline traffic volumes, we'll be able to get the traffic study put together in pretty short order. Uh, but but that's, that's about where we stand right now. So I guess I'll turn it back over to Stephanie if there's any, any questions. All right, thank you, Scott. Um, at this point, I think we probably have, have pretty much um, finished our, our presentation of the revised concept, but uh, just um, one, one thing hit me when, um, when John was talking about our presentation to the commission, um, and I, I just want to um, make certain that this is, that this is clear. Um, with the um, reduced scope of the project and, and, um, and, and having it focus more towards the north and the kind of west of, of the project, right, that well. out, here, um, the rest of the, the site, it looks very open. Um, th there is no phase two. <laughs> so, in case there's any concern about that. Oh, um, what? 
Uh, I'm sorry, is anyone hearing other feedback? Yes. No. Awkward silence. Share your screen, I dare you. Mr. Chairman, should we keep muted? No. Well, at the moment, um, you can proceed. It is okay to proceed? I think so. Okay, thank you. Um, as, as I was explaining, the, uh, the project footprint um, um, is, and, and we're excited about this revised concept design, that it is much smaller, but just to allay any fears, there is no phase two that's coming to the east. So um, um, I think with that said, uh, we're happy to address any comments or questions that the board may have. Um, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So next up is um, discussions and questions from the board. Uh, before the board begins, I would like to ask um, uh, Susan Chapnick, who is the chair of the Conservation Commission, could just speak briefly in regards to um, their hearing from October 1st and their comment letter. Sure, can you hear me? I can, yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, let's see, where am I? Oops, sorry, trying to find my, there we go. Okay, um, thank you Chairman Klein for the opportunity to summarize the Conservation Commission's comments from our third set of comments on the Thorndike Place submittals, which was dated October 9th. Um, we focused our comments on the working session that the Commission had with the applicant and uh, data team, the peer reviewer, um, at our public meeting on October 1st, 2020. Um, some of those comments, though I'm summarizing them here, some of those comments I'm going to change um, ad-libbing just based on a few revisions that were presented by um, John just a few minutes ago. So we will say um, that the Conservation Commission is pleased that the revised conceptual site plan and we want to stress it's conceptual, um, is responsive to several of our prior comments and that it appears to move the proposed project outside or further from wetland resource areas. We're also pleased that the direct access to Route 2, which would have gone right through the bordering vegetated wetlands, has been eliminated from this revision. I want to stress that the Conservation Commission's prior comments concerning the value of the wetlands resources, vegetation replacement, floodplains, stormwater, et cetera, I'm not going to reiterate, um, but they're still valid. Uh, we, have, we have comments in, in four different areas, mainly wetland delineation, floodplain and compensatory storage, stormwater management, and evaluation of wildlife habitat and, and vegetation. And I'll briefly go through these. Um, wetland delineation, as John has acknowledged, um, there's no it is problematic in a winter. Hitler um, is my dad. Somebody else is zoom bombing. Can we figure out who that is? <laughs> Rick, are you on it? I'll continue, but uh, I'm going to stop if it happens again. Um, there is no current legally valid delineation under e either the State Wetlands Protection Act or the Town of Arlington bylaw, as we know. 
Um, based on John's presentation just now, we now understand that a new wetland delineation is planned for this. I heard that there was a hacker. I'm police. Does, is there a coast or co-host who can mute all except for maybe me and the board? And not let them unmute or I don't know what your protocol is. Rick, are you monitoring the, the chat? No, it's not the chat, excuse me. The... I think it might be hind match. Is that it? Uh, I don't know who it is. <laughs> no, it is a match. Okay. Are they off? I'm trying to find their name. Chairman Klein, should I continue? I, I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Just hold on once. Okay. Is that name still attached to the list of names? I'm just scanning it down. It says he's been removed, Rick said in the okay. chat. Oh, okay. perfect. Okay, thank you. Then please okay. do proceed. Yes, thank you. Okay, um, so uh, we understand there's going to be a new wetland delineation this Thursday, um, which uh, though not as not problematic as a winter delineation, I just wanted to mention that we are in a drought um, as, as I'm sure the, um, the wetland um, scientists understand. Uh, and that said, we're looking forward to Beta Group um, being able to review the new wetland delineation based on field data forms and real data. Um, so we'll hold any comments on that until Beta does the review. In terms of floodplain and compensatory flood storage, um, the, the revised conceptual plan shows a reduction of buildings and other structures within the floodplain compared to the March plan. Um, the applicant has still not provided sufficient information to verify the calculation of the flood storage volumes that will be lost under the revised configuration and calculations of compensatory flood storage at each elevation. Um, they understand that. They said they're waiting um, after the conceptual um, plan to provide these, but that makes it difficult then for us and Beta Group to evaluate um, the changes because we're just um, then trusting the applicant's word on the potential advantages of the revisions based on the transmittal, later, uh, transmittal letter table, which John had up before which does show a significant reduction of impacts from approximately 97,000 square feet in March to 17,000 square feet in terms of floodplain. However, we all need to understand that flood storage is measured, measured in cubic feet, not in square feet. So this comparison in terms of flood storage impacts uh, is, is not uh, totally useful at this point. Um, the Conservation Commission strongly recommends that the ZBA require the two-to-one compensatory storage, not the one-to-one -one of the State Wetlands Protection Act. And the reason for that is twofold. One, to be um, consistent and compliant with the town's fire. <laughs> I guess we have another one. <laughs> but even more importantly, also in consideration of increased precipitation and extreme weather events anticipated due to climate change, which must be addressed based on ZBA's own um, bylaw and regulations. To accomplish this, the Conservation Commission has several recommendations to the ZBA at this time and to the applicant. The consideration of the Northwest surface parking area, as John recommended, as a potential location for compensatory flood storage, which is outside of the aura and buffer zone to any wetland resource area. Um, consider opportunities for pl floodplain restoration um, based on wildlife habitat evaluation to evaluate compensatory flood storage within the aura. And if the applicant can't provide two to one compensatory storage based on this conceptual plan um, that is hydraulically unrestricted, 
without negative impacts on resource area values in the aura, then they should look at alternatives. And alternatives may include reducing building impacts in the floodplain if two to one can't be achieved. Um, the third issue is stormwater management. Um, as we've said previously in other comments, the Conservation Commission can't determine whether the revisions meet the stormwater management standards because uh, the necessary detailed stormwater analysis and calculations have not been provided um, as the applicant acknowledges. Um, and the fourth issue concerns the evaluation of wildlife habitat and vegetation. Um, due to the importance of adjacent upland resource areas, that's the aura and buffer zones, to the values of the wetland areas on the site, um, the Conservation Commission recommends that the ZBA require a wildlife habitat evaluation and vegetation evaluation to provide a better understanding of the potential loss of habitat within isolated wetlands and ore zones um, and to help inform beta's group review of compensatory flood storage locations, opportunities, potential opportunities for floodplain restoration, and to better evaluate alternative analysis. Um, so that summarizes our comments um, to date based on our letter and what was presented this evening. Thank you for the opportunity to summarize that. I think you're muted, Chris. I am. Thank you so much, Ms. Jambeck. Um, to questions from the board um, in regards to the presentation. I know there was a question that was raised um, in the chat in regards to the, uh, are there, um, Mr. Hessian, are there calculations for the square footage of the original versus the proposed? Um, can you clarify so, square footage of what? Um, I think both um, the, you know, the, the footprint of the building and the, the gross floor area of the building? I don't have those numbers. Um, I don't have those numbers in front of me, sorry. Okay. But there, there is a reduction in the total, with the elimination of the townhomes and the reduction from 201 units in the multifamily to 175, 178, it is a reduction in footprint and um, gross floor area. Mm -hmm. But we, we could provide, we, those numbers will be provided with the revised um, can be provided with the revised plans as they're developed. And is there, has the number of floors of the building been determined for the new proposed? Yes, I, I presented that um, previously. These, if you can, everybody still see my screen? Yep. Yep. So these, these three, t the three tabs of the multifamily building closest to Dorothy are proposed as three stories. And from the main east-west spine of the building, from including that spine and the three tabs to the south are proposed, will be proposed as four stories. Okay. Thank you for reiterating that. No problem. Uh, are there questions or comments from the board? Mr. Revelak. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have uh, three questions and comments, um, which I'll, I'll, I'll go through. Uh, so my first question is, what uh, if I'd like, to, was wondering if Mr. Hessian could provide an estimate for what the first floor elevation would be in the revised uh, design? Right now, the um the design, it, and it's still a little bit in flux, but the first floor would be at approximately elevation 12. Okay, 
Thank you. So my, my reason for asking is um, last meeting I, ra I you know, asked a couple of questions about um, Cambridge's research uh, and study into you know, their 2070 projections. Um, and I was actually, I was able to find elevations for uh, the 100 year SLRSS in the Alewife area. And I think 12 feet is going to be above it. So I'm, I'm very encouraged to hear that. <laughs> Um, with respect to traffic, uh, and this would be um, probably for Mr. Thornton, uh, be, given the area's proximity to the Alewife T station, uh, a, pretty a pretty large transit center, and the Minuteman bikeway, how does would you know that proximity factor into the traffic study? So we would uh, the main way it would be factored in would be. Um, adjustments to the vehicle trips that we would expect to be generated by the project, uh, where we would expect a number of those trips to be made by, uh, uh, instead of people using personal vehicles, we would expect them to be made by walking or bicycling to, uh, to the Alewife T station or getting on the, the bikeway and connecting to any of the other uh, bike paths in the area and there's so so there would be adjustments that we would make to the project trip generation to account for that effect. Okay, thank you. Uh, my final question has to do with parking uh, and this this question was inspired by a discussion that took place during the Conservation Commission's October 1st working session. Um, my if I recall correctly uh, the thinking was to provide somewhere along the lines of 1.4 spaces per unit. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So, I mean, one thing I'd like to, an idea I would like to throw out to the, to, to the, my colleagues on the board, um, you know, considering the, you know, the, the purpose of 40B, um, you know, to encourage production or construction of low to moderate income housing in cities and towns where local regulations hamper such production. Um, I mean, in some ways, our parking rate, our parking, requ our, our parking requirements do border, you know, do wander into that realm, I think, particularly in the, in the way that, you know, we require one space for a single two or three family home you know, per unit, regardless of the number of bedrooms, but for an apartment, we tend to have higher requirements. Um, I would be curious to hear uh, thoughts from my colleagues as to whether, you know, perhaps it might be worthwhile to go with a lower number of parking spaces uh, to facilitate uh, more compensatory flood storage. Uh, and that's, that's the end of my questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Revelak. There. Other members of the board with questions? I regret I can only see a limited number of you on the screen at a time. Mr. Ford. Mr. Chairman, I have a question, a couple of questions. Um, uh, when will we be able to see some revised elevations uh, without the townhomes involved? Uh, one of the, when we were presented the original elevations and renderings, it really highlighted the trying to have these low townhomes buffering the large residential development. So now that everything's kind of pulled closer to the edge, townhomes are out, um, I, I'm, I'm really interested in seeing the impact on the neighbors. So that's one question if you don't have, uh, maybe you already gave that and I missed it, I apologize. I'll, I'll try to answer that. We didn't, well, the short answer, we didn't provide that information. Um, but again, I think as the design continues, that would be part of the uh, information we would be looking to submit in November. Um, you know, with, with the feedback we've received from conservation and any additional feedback or, or comments we've received tonight might, you know, might dictate some changes. Um, in, in the plan as it uh, develops further. Okay, so so we can expect to see something in November. Then I would, I guess this the second question is also similar into seeing what the revised parking counts would be. I mean, Mr. Revelak, I understand 
you're proposing potentially having lower parking counts, but I would be really hesitant on that given the uh, parking challenges in this area and that have been kind of brought forth. So maybe the question really wants to start, Mr. Hessian, with you and when will we be able to see revised parking counts uh, relative to the requirements? Well, I, I did mention it um, in my presentation that with the reduction in the number of units, um, we believe that we will be able to meet the zoning requirements for parking for multifamily, which is um, you know one space for an efficiency um, unit, 1.15 spaces for a one bedroom, 1 1.5 spaces for a two bedroom, and two spaces for a three bedroom or more. Um, so we were looking at that 1.4 parking ratio, but as the as the design continued to evolve and, and we were looking at where the number of units was ending up and, and where the parking count was ending up, we, we believe we will be able to meet those parking requirements. Um, you know, if there was a reduction in that, um, that would be great. But at this point, we believe that we will not be needing to um, request a waiver from the parking requirements. Okay, great. Thanks. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have a question for Mr. Thornton. Please. So, Mr. Thornton, uh, as a matter of process, uh, when a traffic study is conducted, is that a 12 month snapshot of traffic on, on Lake Street? In, you know, down in all of the adjoining streets? So it's a, um, so in general, we try to get conditions that are representative of an average month time period. And then um, the traffic study impacts are calculated based on the peak hours of the proposed project that coincide with the peak hours of the adjacent street traffic. So in this case, we would be looking at the weekday morning peak hour occurring between seven and nine and the weekday evening peak hour occurring between four and six. So. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, that's fine. So I, I was just gonna add that, that we're looking at conditions at uh, six or seven intersections along Lake Street, as well as headed down to the Route 2 interchange with Lake Street and up to Route 16 and over to Lake Street at the Mass Ave intersection. So, so it's, a pretty, um, it's a pretty comprehensive area to be looking at traffic impacts for the project. But does that include, say, peak usage at Thorndike Field? Um, it, it can, we, can, we can look at some um, usage of the field. It doesn't expressly take that into account unless, it, unless that usage occurs during, uh, during the, I would think, the, the evening peak hours. Because it's it's considerably uh, the the problem itself in terms of traffic on Lake Street is certainly enhanced when people are using Thorndike Field, and that's certainly true in soccer season. And so I just wonder because that's been you know to the naked eye that's been one of the things that seems to have been a stressor on those streets off of Lake Street, and I think that it's appropriate to consider that. Okay, yeah, I mean, that's, that's something we can, we can discuss with the town. Has, has, the, has the town looked at any um, traffic mitigation to address the impacts of the activities on Thorndike Field? I'm not aware of any. I don't know if anyone else can speak to that. Okay. That's fine. I mean, we can ask the question 
of the of the town planning staff. Um, I mean that so, and I would guess that we, um, you know, it may be it may be an anecdotal type of uh, type of review because I'm sure we're, you know, the 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 type of activity that's there now is not representative of the typical activity, but but it's something that we can look at. Thank you. Any further questions, Mr. Dupont? No, I'm all set. Thanks. All right, thank you. Checking on. If there's anyone else on the board who has questions, Mr. Hanlon, do you have a question? Christian, I have a quick question, if I may. Oh, please, Mr. O'Rourke. Yeah. When is this, when in the process regarding the recommended action by the Conservation Commission and their various items, when in this process would we be talking about those and um, having a, you know, fuller discussion and vote? Is that going to be at the wetland impact and stormwater management meeting or should we be talking about them sooner? Because I don't want to do it without giving the applicant time to prepare either. And present. Sure. No, that's a very good question because um, I know that we have currently in our schedule, I mean, essentially after this meeting, we're looking to have the, the applicant um, to work on addressing the, the issues, but I don't know, we don't have a specific uh, meeting in place to discuss um, the specific items raised by the Conservation Commission until we are looking to review the package. Um, are you thinking it would be helpful to have um, either a working session or some other kind of uh, meeting to sort of go point by point through their concerns? Well, I don't know. That's why I asked the question. Um, yeah. I don't know if it's appropriate tonight or not because I'm sure they want to address some of the recommended actions. But there are things I'm just in the interest of time and, and keeping the whole process moving along. You know, let's, let's say, for example, we talk about these at the November 24th meeting, but then we take a vote requiring more items. Is that going to be slow things down? Um, for, I don't know. I mean, I think most, I think most of the items, um, and I don't know if Mr. Hessian can, can address this question at this time or not. I think most of the, uh, most of the recommendations that came from the Conservation Commission are things that would be a part of the next phase of your work at this stage. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, the only piece that had stood out to me was the evaluation of the habitat and the wildlife. Is that something that you will be undertaking? Uh, yes, we will be, you know, at, at the commission's recommendation, we will be looking into that. Okay. Um, and as, as I mentioned, our, our folks that are going out um, this Thursday for the wetland delineation, although they aren't diving into that habitat and vegetation assessment, they're looking, they'll be looking with like an eye towards that to, um, to flag any, you know, critical areas or important things that when we do go back out for that work. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. This is, this is Pat. Um, I just noticed that, I, as I'm sure you were referring to, uh, the November 24th schedule is wetlands impacts and stormwater management. And I, I think that it's fair to say that, that the thought behind that is that all of the matters that have been raised, at, at the very least in the letter we now have from the Conservation Commission, because we have not really gone back and looked at the various other recommendations they have that may be still outstanding. But at the very least, the ones we've received now, I think all would fit or should fit there. And we should, and the applicant should assume that that's, that's the time when we all come together to, to talk about this. And ideally, we would not be in a position then of saying that this is still an ongoing process. We'll be ready to address uh, address the issues that have been raised and be able to say that we've got the best information we can and we're going to have to go with that. Uh, 
And certainly before then, um, um, the beta group will have had an opportunity to uh, review at least the preliminary information and the, the final package coming, or not, excuse me, not the final package, but the revised package that we're expecting from the applicant in November. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yes, please. Hi, Stephanie Thank Keeper you. again. Um, with response to kind of this uh, train of discussion that we're on here, um, I, I do think that it's going to be submitted within our next submittal package um, in, in November. And then the, the intent, as you mentioned, is that Beta then has time to review the information. Um, and to the extent that, and this often happens in these types of projects, so the peer review, they review, um, and then they provide their comments. And then at that point, there's sometimes some level of, of back and forth. So um, I, I think somewhat the, the, the faster turnaround that Beta can do with its peer review that gives um, BSC then an opportunity to um, follow up, you know, with, with its additional information or clarification or, or, or whatnot. Um, and it is often what happens is, so we have a hearing that's dedicated to a topic, but it, it may need to be the case that, you know, there were questions that were raised then or that um, the beta review, there wasn't sufficient time to um, have a, kind of a working session between BSC and beta to, to kind of iron out the areas that sometimes there's like a, a, a catch up maybe at the following hearing or the hearing after that you set aside a limited time of that hearing. So um, I just offer that out there to kind of um, answer or be responsive to that line of thought as to, you know, if we get everything and then we have this hearing, what if there's additional questions or, or what if um, the peer review and, and the project engineer um, haven't had that, that work session all completed. So there's always an ability to say, you know, whatever hearing is going to be de dedicated to, let's say, architectural, but we're going to carve out, you know, and do a catch up of 15 minutes of um, stormwater or what have you. Good, thank you. Um, I did myself have a few questions. Um, in regards to the traffic study, does the, does the traffic study take into account um, the increased use of uh, delivery services? Um, whether it's for goods or for food delivery um, that tend to have very spiky um, uh, times when they arrive? If they're, to the extent that they're included in the traffic counts, then yes. Um, it, it's, and, and, I, and I understand that a lot of those, um, a lot of those types of deliveries occur uh, during the midday, which is not the peak time period for this use or for the adjacent streets. Um, but, but to answer your question, if, if, those, if those types of vehicles and deliveries are included, um, are captured in the traffic counts, then yes, they would be included. Okay, but there's not like a specific factor looking at, you know, Friday evening, there tends to be a rush of food deliveries and that would cause an additional impact. No, no, because 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 it wouldn't it still wouldn't rise to the level of the peak traffic generator of of the use or of the adjacent street traffic. All right, thank you, um, and Mr. Hessian. I believe you already addressed this, but a habitat and wildlife study. You'll be um, keep you'll have that in mind when you're out there Thursday. But that's something that you'll have a follow up on. Mm -hmm. Correct. All right, thank you. Um, I know this was addressed briefly, but the the remainder of the site that's outside the area of, of the building um, is there at this stage um, a sense as to how that space will be utilized, or will it be uh, remain as is? Is the intent to to hold on to it? Is the intent to um, I, either put it under conservation control or what is the intent for the remainder of the property? I, I think that the uh, the intent and, and um, what what the area is and, and how we finalize the uh, the concept plan um, will we'll determine that. But um, there hasn't been a change from our position that we want to just have it preserved open space or, or or the majority of it and what that area exactly is. I think we'll be better defining at our next hearing before the board. Mm -hmm. um, 
so you know leaving some amount of like open space associated with the project and then to say and then there's going to be this chunk of it that that's going to be um protected open space okay Are there any additional questions or comments from the board? Steve, I don't know if your hand is up new or old. Uh, that was an old hand. Uh, let, me, uh, <laughs> let me fix that for you. <laughs> Kevin Mills, I have a question. Yes, Mr. Mills. Um, I note in the new plan, the footpaths have been removed from the site. And I imagine that's to lessen the impact on the wetlands. But I would think at least one footpath from the development over towards Elwife to facilitate foot traffic towards Elwife and keep the foot traffic off the neighborhood. Uh, that would encourage the people to use Elwife more, I would think. Uh, are there any thoughts about uh, replacing at least that one footpath? I'll take that. Um, you're correct in your first assumption, uh, Mr. Mills, that the, the trail system was removed from the revised plan because of the impacts, the additional impacts it had on wetland resource areas. Um, and as Stephanie just mentioned, the, how the, the space remains is open space. I, I think that's something that we're, I'm sure the applicant is happy to work uh, with the board, with the Conservation Commission, um, if, if there's a viable location for that, that um, doesn't, you know, put the project into additional environmental, uh, you know, resource impacts that um, can't be overcome. It, I, I think ideally, if it is preserved as open space, it, just, it does have that similar trail network that was originally proposed, um, but that would be, that's not part of the current proposal. Thank you. Further questions, Mr. Mills? Uh, yes. I would think that in the absence of a footpath, people will find their own way across the property and actually do more damage. So a well-designed path that can be maintained, you know, a surface that can be plowed, be steady and lit would encourage uh, foot traffic and minimize people tromping all over the place, creating their own paths and doing more damage. Uh, it would be a compromise, of course, with the Conservation Commission, because there's no way you're going to do it without touching something. That's right. We'll, we'll, we'll take that um, suggestion and see what we can work into the, uh, Thank you. the design as it progresses. Thanks. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. Mills? No, I'm all set. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions from the board? No. None. Okay, with that, then I will open the meeting up to public comment. Um, as I said before, if you would please raise your hand, um, <clears throat> which you can do from the participants tab. Um, and the first hand I saw is uh, Clarissa Rowe. So Clarissa, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself. Thanks, Christian. Uh, I appreciate all the care that the Zoning Board of Appeals is giving to this. I am concerned about the open space land because um, I think it needs to have money to um, take care of it. At present, there's a lot of dumping. I understand that the homeless pop population has diminished substantially but there are lots of, um, there's a lot of debris in there. And we really think that it's important that the um, owner of the land come and do a cleanup of the area because um, it's full of invasive vegetation. I think there could be ways of having a boardwalk through, through the, um, the wet areas that would um, allow Clarissa, I'm going to ask you to pause for one second. Um, if, for those of you who are on the call who are not actively speaking, if you could please mute yourselves. My apologies, Ms. Rowe, if you could continue. Okay, that's all right. 
Um, I just would like to have a lot more thought given to the open space, come up with a series of pathways. I know that they're thinking of possibly using the, the bridge over Route 2 to get over to Alewife. That bridge is in terrible shape, and I think they need to work with MassDOT to um, repair the bridge or get it torn down. I think there's a lot of value to having the open space as it is, but it, it, open space needs to be cared, cared for and maintained. And I would ask um, the design team and the owners to please step up in their um, thoughts about how to handle that. And the Arlington Grove, Land I think Trust- I lost you. Oh, oh. I th can you hear me now? We can, yes. Okay, the Arlington Land Trust is more than willing to sit with the owners and go through a, a really careful program once all the building considerations have been approved by the neighbors. But, um, you know, this is, this is a very controversial project, but you can't just leave that number of acres just as open space without any kind of care. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Uh, the second hand that I saw was uh, Mr. Seltzer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Um, I have a question regarding the 100-year floodplain. When I look at the September plans provided by Thorndike Place and compare it with the official FEMA map, I find significant differences, particularly in the location of the proposed building. I sent the board some simple diagrams that I drew up to show this. I don't know if they can be put up on the screen at this point. Um, working on that at the moment. Um, the plans that you saw earlier show the floodplain as being two narrow um, fingers that extend over the building. Um, in looking at this, I found that the FEMA flood plan, the second figure, is a lot more extensive than this. Uh, and if you go to the third diagram on this, yes, th this kind of outlines where the differences are. The blue area are the differences between the FEMA map and the Thorndike plan. Everything to the lower right is flood plain. Um, the FEMA definition of floodplain basically covers about half of the area of the proposed building. It also covers the potential parking lot up to the northwest corner. Um, I understand that Thorndike has done their own survey and that's where they think the floodplain is. I just don't know the legalities here as to whether you can use their survey or whether you have to go with the FEMA map. And the difference is that um, with the FEMA map, you'll find that their plans fill in roughly around 50,000 square feet of floodplain, not the 17,000 that was um, stated in the September 28th plan. So I just want to call it to your attention. Thank you very much. Other uh, further comments, Mr. Seltzer? No, that's all I have to say. All right, thank you. Um, the next is uh, John Urowitz. Uh, if you could correct me with the pronunciation of your name, thank you, and you're still on mute. Can you hear me? You can, yes, thank you. Uh, good, thanks. My name is John Urowitz. I've lived at the corner of Martin and Little John Street for 35 years. My, I have two questions and one comment. My first question, I would like to know what the floor grade is for the lowest under parking garage level in the building with regard to Dorothy Road. Number two, I would like to know if the 38 auxiliary parking spaces on the west end of the building near Little John Street are counted in the 1.4 space per unit ratio. And my comment, and this is directed to us, Mr. Thornton, 
he mentioned 26% of, uh, right now, 26% of the traffic volume as to what it was pre-COVID. If Mr. Thorne had come out here during the hours of 3.30 to 6.30, quarter to 7 p.m. and 7 o'clock in the morning till 9 o'clock in the morning, Mondays through Fridays, he would have seen that the traffic was backed up from approximately the bike path to Route 2, especially at evening rush hour. And in the morning coming from Mass Ave, it's backed up to perhaps uh, Orvis Road, uh, down Mass Ave to Lake Street at the bike path at uh, uh, Brooks Ave. Uh, these traffic volumes cannot be assumed to be the same as they were back then due to some repair to COVID, but once they get a vaccine, perhaps this traffic volume is going to shoot way back up close to what it was back then. Thank you for your time. I appreciate your effort. Thank you very much. Um, if I could ask Mr. Hessian, do you have a proposed elevation? I know we have a proposed elevation of 12 foot for the first floor. Do you have one for the garage? Get down. Come on, get down. Get down. Get down. Get down. Um, yes, Mr. Chairman, the, um, as I uh, mentioned earlier, the first floor is approximately elevation 12. Um, Dorothy Road is currently, uh, the existing street is at about 11, elevation 9, and the lowest floor of the garage, it's a one-level garage, is at, will be at approximately elevation 1, about 8 feet below um, the paved surface on Dorothy. Okay. And there was a secondary question about um, whether the 38 spaces that are on the surface are included in the uh, the required parking for the bylaw? Um, the, the spaces closest to the building are included in that count. The spaces that are labeled potential future parking. I believe there's 14 spaces out of that mm -hmm. that are not needed um, to meet the parking requirements under the bylaw. If that makes sense. Yeah. Very good. Um, I am looking at the list of participants and I am not seeing any further public looking to ha ask questions or provide comments. So I'm just gonna ask one more time. Um, if you're interested in asking a question or providing comment, if you go to the participants tab and next to your name, enable the raised hand. Um, yeah, Mr. Urich, if you wanna continue. Please, uh, I'm just going to ask a general question. Will there be future times when ne the neighbors in the, in the in the neighborhood can have access to to make a, a full blown commentary at a public meeting? Um, it, it's a pretty serious deal as far as we're concerned down here. I've been in the engineering architectural business for over 40 years, and I'm kind of like the liaison for the neighborhood. And we really have to get together on this. It's a, it's a huge opportunity for us to have to have. Thank you again. You're welcome. I have a question. Um, Can you hear me? Oh, on the, I, I, I see you are calling in. I'm calling in. Yeah, I didn't do it on my phone, so I wasn't able to raise my hand. Uh, my name is Aaron. <laughs> That's okay. If you could just <laughs> identify yourself, please, first, and go ahead. Sure. My name is, my name is Aaron Freeberger. I live on Parker Street. I've lived here for 16 years and I've, I'm aware of two safety issues that I didn't hear addressed tonight. And I wanted to bring them up. The first one is that there have been fires uh, happening on the property. Um, the Arlington Fire Department has had to come multiple times um, based on smells of smoke, visuals of smoke, um, visuals of fire, um, and they've had to come and put those fires out. Um, so that is a current concern that is happening on the move our property with um, people who are living there. The second is that there are rats now in East Arlington. And my understanding is that there are rats happening 
um, in different parts, um, it's gotten to the point where we've had now 26 neighbors have communicated um, with each other to understand what is happening in our neighborhood. People have put on night uh, motion sensor cameras overnight. We've had um, the Board of Health come, the um, inspector come to help us understand this better because that the town has signaled that this is a significant issue. And we've also brought in private, um, uh, a private firm to come and help us as well. And we have multiple sources saying that um, based on the cameras and the findings that they are coming from the Mugar property. So none of the 26 houses where um, that we had inspected had the uh, had a housing for the rats. They didn't have the um, the burrows. Um, however, there are trackings that there um, is evidence that they are um, coming through our our homes, uh, yards, and neighborhoods, and they're coming to move our property. So that is the background. And my question is: At what point, if there is a point, does the safety concern cross a threshold in which the Mugar would become responsible for the um, what's on their property and the safety of the neighbors surrounding it that are affected by their um, negligence of their property. Well, I think in regards to the, to the status of the current owners, um, let's say I'm not entirely certain who's responsible. Um, Whose responsibility that is? Um, I think that's something that um, I don't know if that if that should be raised specifically um, through other. Well, I would find it relevant to this because if, oh, if Mugar can't be responsible right for the current situation, I don't have any faith that they would follow through on the the obvious outcome of what's going to happen when they do build on this land. And so how they respond to the current concern shows a lot about how they're going to respect and understand our concerns for, you know, what's inevitable for what they're trying to build here. Okay, I understand. So I, I know that it was, it was raised um, as well that, that we need a, a significant plan for how the property is to be managed um, going forward and we'll certainly Take your your comments and your concerns um, into account, and we also um, the fire department is a part of the the ongoing conversation, um, so we'll make sure to follow through with them as well. Okay, I have no further questions. Thank you very much. All right, I see no other. Hands raised. Going once, going twice. All right, so I will close the public comment portion of this meeting. Um, so just to turn back to the board. Um, so moving forward from this point, um, is anticipated that the uh, the applicants will work on the basis of the plan that they have uh, displayed this evening um, to come up with a more complete plan and a more uh, a more detailed plan, both involving the building itself, but also um, the area around the building, taking into account all the comments from the Conservation Commission, uh, from the board, and from the members of the public this evening. Um, just one last opportunity to the board. Are there any other um specific concerns that the board would want the applicant to take into account as they move forward with this um with this next stage of their uh review review of the project um mr revelak well, the, this is actually slightly and somewhat in response to the uh into uh one of the public comments but uh, one on Mr. Hessian's plans, there is a, uh, there's shown a, uh, an access way around the building, which I believe is to facilitate um, fire department access, um, if that helps to allay any concerns. Um, aside from that, I, you know, for myself, I'm, I will wait for the, uh, for the more detailed plans to arrive. Okay. Um, 
Mr. Chairman. Yeah, sure. I'm sorry, go ahead. who is that? The Christian. Mr. Sorry. DuPont, please. Yeah, so, um, so relative to the comments in the memo from the Conservation Commission, uh, you don't feel that it's necessary for us to make a formal request that they respond to those four recommendations and that we will just uh, we will just proceed as if those are going to be addressed. Um, I mean, we can. If you feel it's necessary, if you feel it's necessary, we could um, put together a vote specifically requesting that um, that the applicant, as a part of their next phase, address the questions that are raised um, by the by the conservation commission. Um, certainly, it's within the the applicant's um, you know ability. If they don't want to specifically address a point, they can request a waiver from uh, the specific requirements of the of the local ordinances. But if we would like to reiterate to the applicant that we think it's important that they specifically do address the points raised um, by the conservation commission, we can certainly do that through a motion. I, I would I would like to see that done personally. Okay. Um, before getting to that, are there any other comments from the board? I have one further comment too, and it's relative to the last comment that was made by the caller about the rats. Yeah. So it, it strikes me, and I don't know too much about it, but I'm not going to be surprised if there's rat habitat there. And I would think that in the process of construction. And I don't know whether this falls under the Board of Health, that that's something that would necessarily be addressed. Because if you're displacing a lot of rats, then they're going to have to go somewhere. So it's really more of a question in mm -hmm. terms of is there some process in place to take care of that? Because as a homeowner nearby, I would certainly want to know that there is a contingency mm -hmm. in place for if those vermin start to travel. So is there something, does Board of Health have uh, oversight over something like that, do we know? Um, I actually asked that question of Mr. Valarelli, if he knows, is there a specific um, set of regulations in town that require um, you know, rodent control during construction operations? Uh, there is, Mr. Chairman. That is usually handled. Co uh, actually, it's shared by special services and the Board of Health. Okay. Thank you. Um, and the only other comment I had um, was something that Mr. Revelak had raised, um, is that Cambridge has done some extensive studies recently looking at 100-year um, storm projections, um, looking at climate change, and it is very specific to the areas in Cambridge that abut this property. And so I would just encourage um, the development team to review those documents and take them under advisement as they proceed with their, uh, with their next round of um, development. Um, Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. Um, one of the people in the, cat, in the chat did raise the question that the the level of the parking garage is lower than the uh, the floodplain. Um, I'm sure the applicant has thought a lot about that, but it would be useful to have an explanation for what the implications are of that when you have a high when you when you do have flooding, as in this area, you will certainly have from time to time. Um, what's going to happen to that parking, and what's going to happen to the building, and what's going to ha happen to the people who need to get in and out? Um, this is part of what the Cambridge people are also looking at at the proposals that they're making uh, or in for the plans on nearby and uh, sort of stepping back and looking at the contingency planning would produce at least a discussion that I think both the citizens and I would find interesting. Right, thank you. Um, Mr. Dupont, did you want? Oh, sorry, Mr. Rowick, I missed you. Sorry, go ahead. Mr. Hanlon just reminded me of something. So, um, 
you know, because I happen to also live in a hundred year, you know, a one percent special flood hazard area, um, you know, floodplains are, are something that very that very much interests me. And you know, just in terms of FEMA general guidelines for uh, building in floodplains, you know, I think the underlying idea is allow the water to go in, allow the water to go out, and you know, minimize the time time and effort and cost to repair. But one thing that I think would be relevant to uh, planning, uh, especially with the garage as far below grade as um, we understand it to be, uh, would be pumping infrastructure. So I, that I would like to see that um, included in a future plan. Okay. Uh, Mr. DuPont, did you have a draft for a motion? So I move that the recommendations, the four recommendations that were outlined in the memorandum from Conservation Commission dated October 9th, 2020, uh, be included in the requests uh, that we make of the applicant uh, going forward in the supplement uh, supplementation of their plans. And I'm happy to take any edits to that. <laughs> Thanks it can be worded uh, more succinctly. Mr. Chairman, yes, please. I wonder if it could be. Uh, we were going, are going to get to a schedule, uh, which I think we had discussed earlier. Calls for this to be addressed on the twenty fourth. Uh, Ms. Kiefer has pointed out that you know it, qu questions sometimes come up, and sometimes the, 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 there has to be a further discussion later on. Uh, but I think that it would be helpful to amend the motion to say that the these questions should be addressed as an initial matter at the meeting that is currently scheduled for the 24th. I'm happy for the amendment. Okay. I apologize. I don't understand what the amendment means then, because are we trying to avoid getting to the 24th and then requiring more information from the applicant, which I don't think we want to do. And Mr. Chairman, please. I'm, I'm basically, it was earlier that was suggested that all of this should be dealt with on the 24th. And um, the purpose of the amendment is just to, is just to include that date. So then the, the vote would be that the the recommendation that the, the board would find that the it would excuse me move that the recommendations of the conservation commission dated October 9th um, be included or in the requested considerations. Uh, for the revision of the plans to be addressed on November 20 at the November 24th hearing. Is that essentially the yeah, that's essentially what I had in mind. Okay. And that would just also include in that the, um, the comments from this session. Okay. So the, the recommendation of the Conservation Commission dated October 9th as well as the comments from this hearing of the Zoning Board of Appeals be included in the requested considerations uh, to be addressed uh, by the applicant at the November 24th hearing. Yes. Yes. We have a second on that? Second. Second for Mr. Hanlon. Um, Mr. DuPont, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. Mills? Mr. Mills, how do you vote? Oh, is, is that an aye? Oh, you're still muted, sir. Aye. 
<laughs> Thank you. Mr. Revelak. Aye. Mr. Ford. Aye. Thank you. Mr. O'Rourke. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. The chair votes aye. Thank you. Um, so then the, the next item on the is the tentative schedule for subsequent hearings. Um, so I guess a question more specifically for Mr. Thornton. Um, the, we have on our schedule discussing traffic flow and safety on November 10th. Um, I just wanted to ask if that date is, would work works for you, if, if there's materials that will be available for a substantive discussion on that date. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I, I would think that um, I would think that November tenth, we may have uh, we may have the study uh, complete into beta, but I'm not sure if uh, they will have had an opportunity to complete their review. Okay, um, and and I'm not sure if if your purpose for for the traffic for the for the meeting the traffic's discussed is for for traffic to be uh, presented from uh, the applicant side and then from the peer reviewer side and and that be the end of the traffic discussion mm -hmm. uh, if, if that's the case then you know we may need to um, may need to a little more time another another week or two or uh, conversely, if, if, if we can present um, the traffic study um, and then wait to get peer review back from beta at a later date, then, the, then November 10th would work. Okay. Um, I'd ask Ms. Nover, does that make sense to you or should we hold off on a, a hearing regarding the traffic until it has had an opportunity to really review the documentation. Well, it sounds like, um, Marty Nova with the beta group, it sounds like we're not gonna be able to get our written comments to the board for that November 10th meeting. Um, we received the baseline traffic volumes, um, you know, basically after the close of business Friday. So, and we had, a, it's a short week, so we're not gonna be able to get back um, to them or, or initial comments on that until probably this Friday. So, and then they're going to start their, um, you know, their updated um, report. So it's really up to the board how you want to handle it, but we're not going to be able to have um, much of any comments um, ready for the 10th. Okay. And how much, how much time would you need to review the documentation provided by the applicant in that regard? Well, we would need a, a solid two weeks to get our um, written comments to the board. And then of course, you're gonna need some time to look at it before okay. to discuss. All right, so it sounds like that November 10th date is probably not gonna be, um, not gonna be substantive. Um, so we may wanna go ahead and um, cancel that date maybe and um, I meant the next date that's on the schedule is November 24th, which will be wetland impacts and stormwater management, which I anticipate is going to be a rather uh, lengthy discussion. So possibly um, we could put traffic on with general civil engineering, at least for the moment, on December 8th, um, which would give sufficient time for the development of the materials and for the for proper review. Uh, by our consultants. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Um, in the process of, of doing all of this, at what point do the relevant reports uh, go up on our website? The reason I'm asking is for transportation in particular, everybody is an expert. All you need to have is a driver's license and not even then necessarily. And it seems to me that that there will be a lot of public interest there mm -hmm. and that a lot of people in the neighborhood will know things about traffic in the neighborhood that that probably the experts won't know because they live there. And I'd like to make sure that the technical analyses that are done 
are not only before us so that we can study them, but also before the public so the public can study them so that we can have a hearing that is as useful as it possibly can be in getting all these issues out on the table and putting them in a condition that they can be resolved. So certainly the, what we, we, we try to do is as these documents come in that we distribute them to the board and we distribute them to the website at the same time. Um, and sometimes there's a little bit of a, a lag going on to the website, um, but we're trying, to, uh, we're trying to address that and we're also trying to um, address the, the condition of the documents that are on the website to make it a little easier to navigate and find what people are looking for. I understand at the moment things are um, a little difficult to, to find on the website, but we are going to uh, make an effort in the, in the coming weeks to address that. Um, but certainly as uh, the, when we receive the documentation from the applicant, as it goes to um, the peer review consultant, it will go to the public as well. Um, all right, so if so, um, I guess just to ask Ms. Kiefer, so if we were to pull the November 10th date out of the uh, out of the hearing schedule, then um, I believe the intent from um, the from the, from the uh, Mr. Hetzian is that we would have uh, revised documentation to review on or around November third, uh, which would give three weeks for the review uh, by the uh, peer review ahead of the November twenty fourth hearing, and from Mr. Thornton, it sounds like they're anticipating that they'll have their documentation maybe running a week behind that schedule. Um, does it, so with that in mind, we would keep the November 24th for wetland impacts and stormwater management. We would um, have general civil engineering and traffic scheduled for December 8th, and we would leave the remainder of the dates as they are. Um, does, does that sound appropriate to you? I, I think that does. Um, just one question. Do you, and you may not know this, um, do you have any sense of when you are going to be live, if it's going to be in 2020, or will do you anticipate that all hearings through the end of the year will be remote? I just asked that yeah. because I know that one of the hearings is like December 22nd or 23rd, and I know that quorum purposes and whatnot, that might be and, and public participation and, and, and project team, it might be tricky. So I don't know, are you anticipating I, I, chance? I have not heard anything um, in that regard. And obviously that directive is coming more from the state than it is locally. Um, but I, I will check into that um, and see if there is some direction on that. Mr. Chairman? Yes, please. Just as a technical matter, it seems to me that when we do, when we put out the next the schedule, uh, in light of the motion that we carried uh, a little bit before, we ought to probably, you know, say wetlands and we use the issue headings that the uh, conservation commission has, so that it clearly delineates what all of the things that'll be coming up at that meeting. Okay. Okay, we'll do. Um, uh, just checking with our other. Um, Ms. Nova, are, is there any other questions or comments from from your perspective? I don't have any more. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Haverty. Do you have any comments or questions? Uh, I do not have any questions. Mr. Chairman, the one thing that I, I did have a, a concern about was the statement with regards to the compensatory flood storage and the potential for removing some of the parking um, in order to create additional flood storage area. And I, I was wondering, you know, given the fact that the applicant is, is stating that with the reduction 
and the number of units that they're going to be able to meet the parking requirements, would it make sense for the board to request that the applicant do a parking study um, to determine whether or not it actually needs as many spaces as the bylaws would otherwise require? Given the fact that there does seem to be a very significant concern with regards to this issue, I, I don't think that it's a good idea to be paving any spaces mm -hmm. that don't need to be paved. No, thank you for that. Um, no, this is a good recommendation. Does the um, has the I don't know if that's a question for Mr. Thornton or Mr. Hessian, but has the um, have you taken any look at the or at the anticipated parking requirements in relation to the requirements uh, put forth in the zoning bylaws? So, uh, Scott Thornton, I'll, I'll take a crack at it. Um, we, we have noted, noted that uh, in general in this area, um, some other um, similar residential developments are providing parking at a lower rate than, um, than what is required under the bylaw, um, and in and so there may be a need, or may maybe less of a need to rely on the bylaw for for guidance in this case. Um, however, I think that that you know the intent was really to to look at how we could comply with the bylaw um, and not not look at uh, the, the need for a waiver for, for parking. Okay. I don't know if John has any other comments to add. No, uh, and just add Scott um, to what Scott said, he kind of nailed it, but we, we started looking down that path when the number of units was, you know, greater and the, the conversation back in August was asking about the parking ratio being proposed, but as the, the, the size number of units of the project has been reduced. Um, you know, it, it, we're able, as I said earlier, we're able to meet the parking ratio. Um, doing a parking study to request a lower ratio would put us in a situation where we would be requesting from this board a waiver from the parking requirements under the bylaw. So it's, it, you know, feels a little bit like a, and, and I, there was actually discussion amongst the board members about whether there, it should be a lower ratio, but then, you know, there's parking shortage in this neighborhood. So it's stuck a little bit in the middle, it feels like. Um, but I, I think we've started the work um, to substantiate a lower or to justify a lower count, if that's a direction the board would, you know, like the applicant to, to, to move in. Mr. Chairman, yes, please. Um, I, I, th I would suggest that that it might be useful for the applicant to think about it in a somewhat different way. Um, there, there are a lot of competing values here, and parking is not an absolute. Um, I'm all in favor of having adequate parking in the area, and it's an important consideration. Um, but my understanding is, is that there may be trade-offs between there and having higher environmental protection. And I just think that knowing, having more information about what, what the underlying facts might be or what you might expect would ultimately provide more flexibility to achieve the, ult the optimum solution to uh, all of those problems together. So I, I get it that, that the applicant sort of want, is concerned about being dragged every which way, but so is the board. And figuring out the best way to proceed, if that's where we are at the end of this process, um, may, it may be helpful just to know what kind of flexibility there is. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, it may be a moot point if the applicant is able to comply with the two to one ratio that the Conservation Commission has requested. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just presuming that that might become an issue for them. 
And if that's the case, then this might be a way to help address it. Very good, thank you. Now, other than that, Mr. Chairman, I, I do think we really do need to get a little bit more information in terms of the, the number of total units that are being proposed. Yeah. Um, that does impact the number of parking spaces that are going to be required. It, it impacts um, you know, the trip generation for the traffic report. So uh, you know, I know that they've got it down to a, a fairly small difference in terms of you know, one, uh, 75 or 180 or whatever it might be, but getting that specific number would be helpful. And I, obviously I think you know, the board is going to want to see um, you know, the architectural drawings sooner rather than later so that they can get a sense as to what that's gonna look like and what the impact it's gonna be on the neighboring properties. No, absolutely. And this, especially the tabulation of the, the size of the units, um, you know, what the, what the breakout of that is. Um, in, in a comparison also of the impervious areas um, from the original proposal and the revised proposal would also be helpful. Other than that, I think you know, the board covered a lot of good ground tonight. Um, I think it was very productive. Thank you. Okay, well with that in mind, um, uh, the last item will be to continue, um, and it sounds like we are going to bypass the November 10th date. Um, so Mr. Hanlon, if I could ask uh, for a motion to continue. Mr. Chairman, I move that the hearing in this case be con continued um, to a date certain of November 24th, uh, 2020. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Devon. Going around. Mr. DuPont, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Revelak? Aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. Mr. O'Rourke? Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Chair votes aye. Um, so we are adjourned on the Thorndike Place hearing, which brings us to the conclusion of our main hearing. Um, thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. Uh, I wish to thank Mr. Valorelli, Mr. Heim, and Mr. Lee for all their assistance in preparing for and hosting this meeting online. Uh, please note the purpose of the board's recording of the meeting is to ensure the creation of accurate record of the proceedings. It's our understanding the recording being made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals' website uh, to conclude uh, tonight's meeting. Uh, I'll ask Mr. Hanlon for a motion to adjourn. Motion to move to adjourn. Uh, second. 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 Second, Mr. DuPont. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you all very much for attending this evening. Thank you. Appreciate Thank the help. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank Take you. care. Thank you.